Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be back in Riverside Avondale, where I lived for 13 years. Uh, this is a talk about two very strange bedfellows, <laughs> leadership development and symphony orchestras. But to be honest, it's actually a talk about expanding your self-awareness. Now, everybody who's ever lived knows that it's a challenge to expand your self-awareness because we all have blind spots. But for a leader, it is particularly challenging because if one of your people should decide to do you the favor of telling you about one of your blind spots, <laughs> you're very likely going to take this as a challenge to your authority. And then secondly, to the extent that you have power as a leader, um, people are only going to tell you the things that they think you want to hear. It can be very difficult to get the truth. And then thirdly, with modern organizations as complex as they are, there's such a lag between when you take an action as a leader and when the result is produced that to, to link the two can be very tenuous at best. And yet, it is critical for leaders to improve their self-awareness because every small improvement is going to be felt as an enormous relief by the people who take directions from you. So, wouldn't it be great if there were some kind of leadership laboratory where you could see your strengths and more importantly, see your potential strengths and see your weaknesses and blind spots in complete safety and where the laboratory worked so fast that there was always a direct connection a cause and effect connection between behavior and results. Well, while I was music director of the Jacksonville Symphony, I was on this quest to build audience and connect the orchestra to the community. But the stunning discovery that I made was that there did exist this laboratory, and it was my orchestra. It was the perfect laboratory for learning about leadership development. And I'll show you how it works. So, inside of a symphony orchestra, you place your audience of engineers or executives or uh, sales reps or scientists or hospital workers. It really doesn't matter what kind of people because it works for everyone. In this case, it's civil servants from one of the agencies of the Dutch government inside the famous residency orchestra in The Hague. And you put them close enough to the musicians so they can experience at close range uh, both the, the, the amazing technical things that they're doing with their hands, but also the sound, which is fascinating. But the most fascinating part is when I design some kind of role play. Uh, and the role play dramatizes in real time some kind of leadership issue. And, uh, and I, ask the, I hand the microphone to a musician and ask them to comment on what has happened. And musicians here, you can see at the bottom here, are, are very good truth tellers. <laughs> they talk about what's going on and when there is a truth which comes to light, you can see the spontaneous and totally unselfconscious laughter that comes about from the participants and the musicians alike. So, let's imagine that you have in your audience some, some leaders who are living under the delusion that it's what they say that counts and that what they do doesn't really matter if they've said the right thing. Well, Watch the way this might play out. We're going to build to a big climax and a really impressive climax here. But once I conduct here, I show no commitment whatsoever. I'm just doing the minimum. I want to talk to the trumpets. 
They don't get to play that many notes in this piece. And therefore, every note that they play is important. Uh, talk about that experience just now with that conductor. Well, you said that there was going to be a climax and a payoff, but we never got that from you. It was pretty much just time. And we kind of, were, oh, I was waiting for the payoff, and we just kind of bum, ba dum, bum, ba dum. <laughs> You know what I mean? So I was, I was, okay, here it comes, but no, it's still not there. Well, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but let me just be the conductor's lawyer for a moment. Uh, he gave a really good description, didn't he? Of, I mean, when, when I said that, didn't that really seem to you like, wow, the, yeah, let's, we can do that, right? So why isn't that enough? Well, I mean, well, I feel like if, if I just went with what I thought, I was going to be sticking out all by myself. If I mean, if I went with the dynamics written and said, well, I know how this goes, well, yeah, but I'd probably look like the idiot because I'd be the one sticking out. That's so beautifully said. And, you know, and that's the problem with not walking the talk. Um, you don't realize the way it's going to make other people inhibit themselves when there's a mixed message, when you say one thing but you don't actually carry through and don't actually do it yourself. So leaders who send mixed messages are sort of blind to the quandary that it puts their people in because there becomes the question, are we going to follow him? Are we following him? And suddenly there's a whole political thing going on in the organization about who is and who isn't. Uh, all revealed by these wonderful remarks of the trumpet player. Or let's say you have another kind of leader who believes that he or she adds value by owning all the details of what their workforce is doing. Here I am conducting exactly like that leader. Notice that there's every detail in the music I'm involving myself in. So, excuse me. I want to get this microphone to the principal flute, who didn't play a note, but certainly enjoyed that demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> so, talk about what it's like playing for the orchestra with this conductor. Well, um it makes me feel as if I can't do my own thing. It makes me feel like as if everything, I mean, you're micromanaging everything, essentially. So it, you're doing too much. And it's actually very distracting, um, because instead of thinking about the music, I'm seeing you trying to handle every single detail, which is a little... Well, can I argue with you for a moment? That don't you want a conductor who knows all the details of the whole operation and understands how it all fits together? There's a difference between knowing the details of the operation and um, there's a difference between knowing that and then trusting that that's going to happen. You don't have to necessarily stake your claim in every single aspect of the orchestra that's going on at one time. Well, suppose I said, I said, look, I'm really invested in this performance. I want it to be really great. I've worked really hard for this, and I know how all the parts fit together, and I'm just taking care that everything goes right. You're telling me that's, that's not going to work. Well, it's because you're trying too hard, it, it sort of chokes us in what we're able to do. Did you say it chokes the orchestra? Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's a very real feeling, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And describe just exactly how nauseating it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're doing a demonstration now, so it, it you know, it, for us, it's, it's comedic, but, um, <laughs> but, but really, if, if, if we had a conductor that was like that, that every single time that we came to rehearsal was dictating every single thing that we were doing, we would, as artists, we would just feel completely demoralized because we wouldn't be able to um, say what we're supposed to say. 
So you see that there's tremendous richness in this metaphor and so many things that can be explored. But let's, let's imagine for a moment, I pulled two of you from the corners of the room and brought you up to the podium to look out at what the conductor sees. You'd probably see something like this. This big panoramic view that takes in everything. And when the orchestra started to play, it would come as a revelation to you. All these various parts that you would experience as parts suddenly falling together like the various pieces of a puzzle, making sense and revealing some greater thing. This is the position of the leader, the place where all the information flows, where you can see the strategic necessities of what has to go on. Well, as a leader, you get used to that, and it's easy to lose sight after a while of that the people who are carrying out your directions are not living in that reality. They're living in a completely different reality. Does my read work? Am I covering the holes properly? Uh, is my bow the right tension? You know, am I playing the right notes? Uh, uh, you know, is there water in my trumpet? All those kinds of concerns. Uh, and so the worlds that are occupied by the leader and the worker are so different. Here, at the bottom, you see what the leader looks out at. But at the top, can you find the conductor there? All that little dot there? Uh, and so they live in such different realities. And this is the principal reason that there's so much antipathy and misery normally in the relationship between conductor and orchestra. As a violist in the Baltimore Symphony told me on the eve of my debut there, he said, the conductor is the natural enemy of the orchestral musician. <laughs> And I said, well, no, that's not going to be, that's, that's not going to be me, that'll, that'll never be me, I said, at the beginning of my career. But once you're on the podium, you begin to realize that it comes with the podium. Unless you find a way to bridge that difference. And so, decades on the podium, and a decade living in my laboratory of leadership development, finally taught me that you can use the podium in a different way. You can use that in order to share with other people the strategic reality that you understand and you see easily and understand through no fault of their own, they cannot see it just simply because they are in the chairs. And the more that they get from you what that big reality is, the more informed the decisions that they make can be. And then you have the leader and the worker working together. And particularly when the leader seeks to give a direction now, you want to be sure that not only does it make sense from your podium, but through your imagination you conceive of what's it going to be like when that direction lands in the chair? Is that worker going to be able to translate that direction into action easily? Does it make sense from their point of view? And so, if there's a lesson in all of this, it is that when you're a leader and you're looking to improve, and it's so worthy that every leader should improve, what most people do is dig down deeper into where they live, into their own jobs. And they never get the benefit of venturing outside of their comfort into some kind of other world, especially some metaphor that reflects upon what it is that you do and shows you more truly who you are than you could ever find if you kept on looking for it where you work. And so, I want to encourage all of you to have the courage to, to seek that kind of stimulation outside where you are. And if it should ever happen that you feel vexed, that you feel confused, that you feel discouraged with leadership challenges because we all know that at one point or another they are. Less than two miles from where you're sitting, there is Jacoby Hall and the Jacksonville Symphony Orchestra. And there you can always see an organization that knows what it is to work in harmony. Thank you very much. <laughs>